Suni and Butch are veteran astronauts with experience on a variety of spacecraft throughout their careers. And on the return of the Crew-9 mission, they just got the first ride on SpaceX's famous Crew Dragon. It delivered an experience unlike anything they'd had before. More space, more comfort, more modern tech. So, what did they experience inside this spacecraft? How does it differ from the others? Let's dive in and find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. With around 25 years of experience as astronauts, Sunita Suni Williams and Barry Butch Wilmore have flown on various spacecraft from different countries. Suni has traveled aboard the Space Shuttle STS-116 and Russia's Soyuz TMA-05M, while Butch has flown on STS-129 and Soyuz TMA-14M. More recently, both took part in Boeing's CST-100 Starliner test flight, but this time, it was a whole new experience. Their first time flying home on SpaceX's Crew Dragon, after spending over nine months stuck on the ISS, with touchscreen controls, a sleek design, and full reusability, it's a pretty big shift from the spacecraft they were used to. For example, the difference becomes even clearer when compared to the Soyuz spacecraft. Don Pettit, an astronaut and chemical engineer who flew on Soyuz TMA-03M, once shared with the press, From the engineering perspective, smaller is better and cheaper to launch. From a crew comfort viewpoint, the Soyuz is cramped. I might even say cramped squared. Once strapped in, my heels are nearly in contact with my butt. I am tied down at eight points to a form-fitting couch, making it difficult to move anything other than my arms. This feels more like a medieval torture chamber than a rocket cockpit, a tiny space of just five cubic meters crammed with three astronauts and their bulky protective suits. It's no wonder he'd say something like that. By contrast, Crew Dragon's 9.3 cubic meters, nearly double that, feels like a luxury suite, built for up to seven, but typically hosting four. On the recent Crew-9 mission, those four astronauts seemed right at home, a testament to the roominess. That space comes from Dragon's hefty design, a 16-foot tall, 13-foot wide pressurized capsule atop a 12-foot trunk, doubling as power supply and cargo bay. Stepping inside, Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore must have marveled at the difference from Apollo's chaotic, switch-filled cabins, cramped relics they'd never fully decode. Instead of the old control panels filled with switches and buttons, Dragon's cockpit is streamlined and futuristic. Right in front of the crew, there's just a large touchscreen displaying all the critical flight data, position, speed, spacecraft status. If needed, the astronauts can interact with the screen to make adjustments or handle emergencies. But here's the interesting part. Dragon flies completely autonomously. Unless something unusual happens, there's no need for the crew to take manual control. Mission control on the ground handles any adjustments remotely, making it a very different experience from older spacecraft that required hands-on piloting. That doesn't mean astronauts are just passengers, though. If needed, they can override the system using touchscreen controls, a modern shift from the traditional switches and joysticks of the past. But in normal conditions, Dragon runs the show, making spaceflight feel more like riding a smart spaceship than piloting one. Oh, and here's something truly unique about Dragon. Something I bet no other spacecraft, not even Starliner, has a built-in toilet. SpaceX equipped Dragon with a small vacuum suction toilet tucked near the ceiling of the cabin, right by the hatch from an astronaut's perspective. This system uses suction, fans, and storage tanks to handle waste in microgravity. It's been used on missions like Inspiration4 and Crew9, but not without some hiccups, especially when it came to the urine container. During Inspiration4, a tube connected to the waste storage system came loose, allowing urine to leak into the floor of the capsule. While this didn't cause immediate issues for the crew, it was a concern for long-term missions. A similar issue was later discovered in Crew 2's Dragon after its return, where SpaceX engineers found that the leak had caused corrosion in some areas. By Crew 9, the issue was fully resolved, proving that even in space travel, plumbing problems can't be ignored. This little detail makes a huge difference on long-duration flights, like the 17-hour journey Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore took from the ISS back to Earth, so they don't have to wear those sweaty diapers. Speaking of comfort, some people with claustrophobia say they can't imagine being crammed into a tiny spacecraft in a bulky spacesuit. But here's the thing. SpaceX's IVA suits aren't bulky at all. Unlike the bright orange pumpkin suits from the shuttle era or the stiff so-called suits of Soyuz, these flight suits are sleek, form-fitting, and look like they're straight out of a sci-fi movie. But it's not just about style. The outer layer is made of Nomex, a fire-resistant material similar to Kevlar, shielding astronauts from fire or sudden cabin depressurization. 
Inside, a built-in cooling system keeps their body temperature steady throughout the flight. And then there's the game changer, a single umbilical connection. Forget the tangle of tubes and wires, astronauts just plug in one cable and it handles everything. Oxygen supply, temperature control, comms with mission control, and real-time health monitoring. No switches, no fiddling around. As Chris Trigg, SpaceX's crew equipment manager, explains, one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, something that the crew just literally has to plug in when they sit down, and the suit takes care of things from there. This focus on comfort and convenience isn't just about luxury, it ties directly to SpaceX's long-term ambitions. While most spacesuits today, like those on the ISS, are made for short-term use in low Earth orbit, SpaceX aims beyond. They're designing for Moon and Mars missions, where suits must endure longer stretches. To make that possible, SpaceX is tackling a range of challenges, making rigorous suit testing a key part of the upcoming five-day Polaris. One of the most critical aspects? Pressure regulation. Without precise control, astronauts could face serious dangers, something Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov experienced firsthand. In 1965, during the first ever spacewalk, his EVA suit expanded so much in the vacuum of space that he struggled to fit back into the airlock. With no other choice, he had to manually vent air from his suit just to squeeze inside his spacecraft. It was a terrifying lesson in why spacesuit design matters. All right, that's just a little side story. Let's get back to the Dragon. On the outside, Dragon is wrapped in a heat shield made of Pika-X, a SpaceX innovation that improves on NASA's phenolic-impregnated carbon ablator. This material can withstand re-entry temperatures hotter than molten lava, over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, without cracking or melting. SUNY Williams and Butch Wilmore didn't feel the slightest bit hot as they splashed down in the Gulf of America, but that heat shield is why Dragon is reusable. Unlike the Space Shuttle, which needed months of tender loving care after every mission, Dragon is designed for quick turnarounds, making space travel more routine than ever. Dragon's heat shield might steal the spotlight, but its solar panels are the real unsung heroes. Stretched across the trunk, these sleek black arrays aren't just eye candy. They power everything, from the touchscreen cockpit to the vacuum toilet, soaking up sunlight like a lifeline. While Soyuz stumbles to the ISS on battery packs that fade in six hours, a ticking clock, Dragon's solar setup pumps out over 2,000 watt-hours per orbit. That's enough to cruise through Crew 9's 17-hour return with energy to spare. Older designs don't even come close. The Space Shuttle had solar panels too, but they unfolded like a clunky origami puzzle, eating up space and time. Dragons are built into the trunk. Compact, no fuss, no moving parts. Starliner. Its service module has solar cells, but they're puny, dumped before re-entry, and can't haul cargo like Dragon's trunk does. SpaceX didn't just add panels, they crafted a rugged, reusable power system that keeps four astronauts comfortable while lugging science gear back to Earth. More importantly, the cost and performance differences are striking. A seat on Crew Dragon runs about $55 million, far more cost-effective than Starliner's hefty $90 million per seat. And while Dragon has already completed 10 official crewed missions to the ISS, Starliner is still waiting for its first certified human flight. Yet, despite Dragon's achievements, including a rescue mission, NASA still favors Starliner, doubling down on its investment without flinching at its skyrocketing costs. Boeing took a $523 million hit on Starliner in 2024, pushing total losses past $2 billion. Their SEC filing blames it on delays, insane testing costs, and pricey post-certification flights, a steep price for a ship that hasn't even started regular crew missions. Still, NASA isn't backing down. Instead, they're pushing for another flight, determined to get Starliner into the rotation. Right after Crew Dragon wrapped up its Crew-9 mission, NASA made it clear, they're still sticking with Starliner. During a press conference, Steve Stick, head of NASA's commercial crew program, confirmed that another test flight is planned before Starliner can start crew rotation missions. What we'd like to do is that one flight and then get into a crew rotation flight, he said. So, the next flight up would really test all the changes we're making to the vehicle, and then the next flight beyond that, we really need to get Boeing into a crew rotation. So, that's the strategy. The upcoming test flight might be uncrewed, but NASA wants to make sure Starliner is fully capable of carrying astronauts. As Steve Stish put it, even if we fly it back without a crew, we still want it to be crew capable. So we want all the systems in place that would allow us to fly with a crew. It's clear why NASA's sticking with this. 
They're giving Starliner a shot to prove itself, diversifying their options, and leaning on Boeing's long aerospace legacy. It's a smart play, even if the cash keeps pouring out. Still, Dragon's out there, quietly racking up wins with every mission. NASA's trust in Starliner isn't misplaced, it's pragmatic. But Dragon's steady reliability raises a question. Are they putting their chips on the right contender? Especially when it's assigned to massive missions. Coming up on March 31, 2025, the Dragon Resilient spacecraft will lift off from Launch Pad 39A in Florida, carrying out the FRAM-2 mission, the first crewed flight over Earth's polar orbit. It's the first human spaceflight to sweep over Earth's polar regions in low Earth orbit. Unlike most missions hugging lower latitudes, this one charts a daring course above the poles, a route crewed spacecraft rarely tackle. For one, it opens up new research in microgravity, like offering a fresh perspective on Earth's climate from a rarely seen vantage point. It also marks another milestone for Dragon, proving it can take on complex missions no other U.S. commercial spacecraft has attempted. But FRAM-2 isn't just about pushing boundaries in orbit, it's also changing how Dragon comes home. This mission is set to be the first Crew Dragon flight that won't splash down off Florida's coast, as SpaceX shifts recovery operations to the west coast. The change is designed to better control the descent of the trunk, the unpressurized module that separates from the spacecraft and re-enters Earth's atmosphere. With Crew-9's recent return, it's possible we've seen the last Crew Dragon splash down off Florida's coast as SpaceX plans to shift future recoveries to the Pacific. Meanwhile, NASA has yet to confirm the timing of Crew-11's rescue mission, but it will likely rely on SpaceX once again. Boeing's Starliner remains stuck in certification hurdles, with ongoing technical and safety issues pushing its first operational crew rotation further down the road, possibly until 2026. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you soon.